teaching the brain to read, strategies for improving fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. Fluency Building from the Brain to the Book Page 47 Fluency is the ability to read text accurately and quickly. Fluency means faster, smoother reading that approaches the speed of speech. When reading out loud, students with successful fluency read expressively, naturally, and effortlessly as they mentally divide the text into meaningful, distinct, related phrases. These students can decode accurately and rapidly, automatically group words appropriately, and scan ahead for cues such as punctuation. For students to know where to pause and when to change voice pitch, they need to decode while also scanning ahead to see how the sentence ends. The ability to read fluently allows students to understand and interact with what they read. Fluency appears to be related to neural patterning from the visual sensory intake and print word processing areas in the occipital lobes. Neural networks connect the auditory processing centers and students' temporal lobes to their executive functioning and word identification centers in their prefrontal lobes. Geek, 2006. Fluent readers can decode, recognize, and comprehend the meaning of text at the same time, so their networks fire directly and efficiently. Reading practice reinforces the neural circuits that swiftly decode the written words, enabling students to look ahead and respond automatically to the punctuation at the end of a sentence, be it a question mark, exclamation point, or an adverb describing the state of a character, as in he whispered anxiously. Page 48 Listening to and watching students read gives us insight into their fluency. Observe which students are automatically recognizing the words and punctuation as they read. Beginning readers focus their attention on deciphering individual words. Their oral reading may be incorrectly chunked and may sound flat and void of vocal inflection. Students who need to build fluency skills may make more frequent errors in both reading and comprehension because they are so focused on trying to read individual words that they are not able to successfully summarize or interpret what they have just read. Their brain networks may not be automatically processing recognized words and propelling this information to the executive function networks. The visual input of the unfamiliar words may take a detour through decoding and pattern matching which would disrupt fluency. With practice, as children increase their decoding skills and speed, they increase their neural processing efficiency and read with greater expression and comprehension. PET scans and fMRI scans suggest multiple reading networks in the brain working in parallel and in sequence to process, code, and retrieve the information that together results in reading fluency and comprehension. Before these networks were described, it was believed by many that reading was a left brain activity, Jacobs, Shaw, and Scheibel, 1993. By 1998, neuroimaging evidence suggested that recognizing speech sounds, decoding written words, finding the meanings of words, comprehending complex text, making inferences, analyzing, and using the information from the reading to make new associations, appeared to stimulate neural subsystems in both brain hemispheres. Beeman and Chiarello, 1998. Of special significance to the reading processes of fluency beyond simple decoding is the brain's initial processing of new sensory input through short-term or working memory networks. It is this part of the memory system that appears to be critical to fluency development. Page 49. This leads me to the strategies I suggest to allow the meaning of the decoded words to remain in memory long enough to connect with the other words in the sentence, paragraph, or page. The goal is for students to maintain the information in working memory long enough to make associations, recognize relationships, and pattern the information successfully into fluent reading. Information from functional images and key suggest connections between the brain's response to written text and metabolic activation in the alerting association systems in the posterior left temporal and occipital lobes. It then appears that if the stimuli successfully pass through the effective filters and alerting systems, areas of stored related memories are activated to consolidate matching between the new data and information that has been previously stored. Coles, 2004. PET scans show dramatic differences between a brain learning to recognize a category and one that has already established the category. This research supports a distinction between developing a skill and using it. 
recognizing that particular information or sensory input fits into an established category correlates on scans with neural activation in the association recognition systems. When the input is not recognized as having an association with previously stored data, the new information would need to be stored as a new recognition category, Peterson, Carpenter, and Fenema, 1988. It follows that storing entirely new information would be less efficient and permanent than storing information that is linked to previous memories. Strategies to build category memory banks will be described in the comprehension chapter along with strategies aimed at increasing relationships between new and previously stored knowledge. Once the recognition linkage is made, the new data, the word that was decoded, can remain in working memory long enough to have meaning. If the newly linked memory is then processed further through mental manipulation, cognitive processing in the prefrontal cortex, the information appears to have greater likelihood of becoming a stored long-term memory, Coles, 2004. Page 50. As more information is interpreted through neuroimaging about regional brain subspecialization, evidence is building to support the existence of such specialization in an executive function region of frontal lobes. There appear to be sections within the prefrontal cortex distinguishable on scans as especially active during judgment, analysis, prioritizing, organizing, directing selective attentive focus, and sequencing. For example, the patterns and sequencing functions of concepts of print, turning pages, and reading print in the right direction are associated with neuroimaging activation within the executive function regions of the prefrontal cortex, McGaw, McIntyre, and power 2002 verbal fluency is associated with increased metabolic activity in the left prefrontal cortex functional mri scans localize activity in this same prefrontal cortex region when executive function is engaged in by the subjects the three tasks used that resulted in the activation of this proposed verbal fluency network were having subjects repeat words they heard say the opposite of the word or say a word starting with a given letter, Phelps, Heider, Blameyer, and Schulman, 1997. Of interest is that the same executive function network activated during the executive function activities of analysis and judgment were also activated when subjects were shown patterns that stimulate the same eye movements that are made when readers move their eyes across a line of print as they read aloud with fluency, Politsk and Rayner, 1990. One interpretation is that the development of this part of the brain through activities that correlate with its neural activation on scans might increase a reader's potential to identify letters and words in the sequence of a sentence and turn them into meaning. Politsk and Rayner, 1990. This chapter correlates the neurological research pertaining to building verbal or oral fluency with strategies based on my interpretations of this research and the ways it can be applied in the classroom. The fluency that is required for text comprehension will be covered in more detail in the comprehension chapter. Page 51. These and other brain research-based theories are the basis of the strategies I have applied with my students to build their fluency by constructing bridges between patterns of letters, word recognition, and comprehension. My interpretation of the research is that as the brain practices and builds neural networks that efficiently decode and recognize words, readers will not have to dedicate as much of their brain's processing activity to decoding, leaving more focus to attend to the meaning of text. The goal of the strategies suggested here is to increase students' building of relational memories between the short-term memories that accompany newly read text and the information already stored in their background of knowledge. Strategies to build decoding efficiency, word recognition speed, and fluency include model reading, re-reading or choral reading, paired reading, independent reading, and tape-recorded reading. When students have multiple opportunities to read the same text with corrective feedback and enjoy the positive reinforcement of recognizing their progress, they are on the road to greater fluency. Building Word Recognition Speed Functional MRI scans done on average adult readers found a correlation between rapid automatized naming RAN, activities, where they name items presented rapidly in a sequence, and increased neural activity in the same inferior frontal cortex brain regions activated when subjects engaged in more complex reading. 
Their success in the RAND tests also correlated with their complex reading skill, Misra, Katzer, Wolf, and Poldrak, 2004. Most children and adults with fluency problems receive low scores on rapid naming. This correlation between the rapid naming area of brain activation and the inferior frontal cortex, one of the brain's most active reading and memory centers, is suggestive for strategies that build word recognition skills through practice in oral naming, Misra et al., 2004. Page 52. Although naming requires phonological processing, Evidence suggests that naming speed is only modestly correlated with performance on phonological awareness tasks such as blending, Wagner, Torchson, and Rashat, 1994. The greatest correlation is between naming speed improvement and increased practice with letter and word identification tasks. In using this as a fluency building strategy, students can practice naming familiar visual symbols, such as letters, numbers, or words presented in random order. Wolf et al., 2002. Rapid Naming Practice I implemented rapid naming practice by having students create their own lists suited to their needs. After first using timed assessments of rapid naming of numbers, letters, or words, depending on my previous observations of the student's level of fluency, I determine what level of naming would be appropriate for them to work on. If their letter naming is slow, I have students make a stack of index cards with the letters printed on them. Other students make their stacks of cards with familiar words. Students' motivation increases because I offer lists of ability-appropriate words from which students can select the words for their practice. I have also created specific lists of words relating to topics of high interest to many students such as sports, music, and computers. The goal here is not for students to learn new words, but rather for students to increase the speed with which they can name familiar words. Practice sessions are scheduled during class, individually or in pairs. One student flips the cards while the partner responds, and for homework. Some students don't concentrate well on this type of activity in the classroom, especially if they are easily distracted or have a hard time staying on task for repetition activities. Here. Parent helpers are great resources when they can work with individual students in a quiet place outside the classroom. These practice sessions are not timed to keep stress down, but students know that they are working to increase their speed. Page 53. To further increase student motivation in this type of practice, I have students keep charts where they record their progress when we do periodic one-on-one -on -one timed measurement assessments of the number of words, letters, or numbers they read correctly in one minute. I show students how to graph their speed by counting the number of words, numbers, or letters read in a minute. Recognition of their progress appears to resonate with students' dopamine pleasure response, effective filters, and goal-directed skills. Graphing is motivating because it makes progress evident. I help students set individually reachable but challenging WCPM, words correct per minute, goals. Practice in word or symbol naming with visible, charted progress toward their desired goal promotes their perseverance, just as seeing improvement in running speed motivates track activity participants or charting weight loss motivates dieters. The ability to see that their rereading efforts pay off over time allows students to tolerate occasional failures as they pursue fluency. For less fluent readers, Monitoring their individual progress is especially valuable when they have felt frustrated by previous comparisons to classmates. They experience a sense of accomplishment when they recognize that their effort resulted in progress. These charts can be even more helpful if students and teachers work together to build student metacognition strategies. Students can be prompted to think about what they did that resulted in the improvements on their charts. If they write down their strategy, such as more practice with the taped reading or more reading with my partner, they will learn which strategies are best for their learning styles and expand the use of these strategies into other reading and learning situations. Page 54 Although it is not always engaging to review and rehearse word lists with flashcards, this type of activity can be made more engaging when students have input, such as selecting which cards they want to work on words about the ocean or words about outer space. 
Students also can make their index cards from approved lists of words with high interests to them that are still in their independent reading range. Then the focus is on building speed because accuracy is already there. The object is not for students to memorize new sight words, but rather to promote neural activity in their inferior frontal lobes as they respond to items presented rapidly in a sequence. The hope is that stimulation of the neuronal circuits in this important reading network will carry over into reading fluency. Repeated reading Repeated reading is a strategy that can be used when students in a class are at different levels of fluency. It works best when done in small groups based on fluency level. Word-by-word -word readers or those who have difficulty sounding out words need more instruction and practice in fluent application of phonics to single words and practice recognizing high-frequency words so they can read orally at their decodable instructional level. More advanced fluency students can work to build fluency with more complex words and at their higher instructional level. Even very skilled readers may read in a slow, deliberate manner when reading texts with many unfamiliar words or topics. The goal of fluency building, ability level rereading is to provide individualized opportunities for skill growth. Page 55. This means reading groups need to be small enough to be low stress and to offer each student enough time to orally reread several times, with guidance, so fluency can truly improve. When small groups are beyond your resources as an individual classroom teacher, instructional aides, parent helpers, peer partners, Response reading with audio tapes, and computer-assisted oral reading can help. The practice of repeated reading builds fluency in a way similar to the RAN practice, but by using student-level decodable text instead of individual cards. Students repeatedly read the same text until the words are so familiar that they can attend to more than sounding out individual words and look ahead at the sentence to use word and punctuation cues to add expression to their voice and comprehension to their reading. Repeated reading, especially of predictable, patterned stories, is consistent with my interpretation of teaching in a manner structured to be brain compatible. The best text material to use in oral rereading is material that is interesting to students. Text material should also be appropriately challenging, just above their independent reading level. I select decodable books that are high interest, based my students' interests, current activities in their lives or their response to other topics we are investigating in cross-curricular activities. I alternate between repeated reading books I select and those that students in each fluency ability group choose from those I pre-select based on the group's instructional level. I look for decodables that are not predictable in rhyme or repetition style because the goal is not memorization of a script, but increasing familiarity with the actual reading of each word. After I read the text aloud, I start the rereading process with a passage of 5100 words. To decrease stress, lower effective filters, and make the very first exposure to the book more pleasurable, students can have the option of simply listening without trying to follow along in their decodables or with a big book. For the second reading, students follow along and I let them know when to turn the page so they'll be able to keep up even if they haven't followed the text. Page 56 Guided Rereading To assure unobstructed passage of the visual text input to the hippocampus, the text for rereading practice needs to be within a comfort zone of independent reading success so the focus will not be on decoding, but on the development of fluency. After my initial read aloud, the whole group rereads the passage with me. For each subsequent reading, I emphasize just one of the punctuation marks or other cues such as pauses for commas or raising of pitch when sentences end with question marks. I guide and model reading connected phrases and clauses without breaks. When individuals want to try reading the passage independently they can volunteer to do so. When most students can successfully reread several passages without my help, I gradually lower the volume of my speech and walk around the group as they read to hear individuals. I divide the students into pairs or threesomes and they reread several passages to one another. When the pairs are ready, I listen to them read. For homework, students are encouraged to read their passages to family members. After successful rereading activities in class, I explain the strategy of rereading as it can apply to independent reading. I ask student volunteers to model the strategy with a new passage or book. 
I explain that when they are reading independently and come to a word that is unfamiliar and not immediately decodable, they should ask for help and then read and reread the sentence aloud as they gain fluency. The time when students have begun to decode with increasing fluency is a critical period to motivate them as readers. Engaging books are not always part of packaged reading curriculum that is phonics heavy. As you go through decodable books seeking ones for fluency practice, look for books at students' reading levels that offer opportunities for them to practice sound letter correspondence and decoding, that are engaging, and that include and emphasize the newly learned pairings. Page 57. The motivation needed for students to want to reread these decodable texts is critical if the pairings they learn are to be reinforced and add to their fluency. Word recognition and decoding appear most brain compatible when the practice activities are about personally relevant topics. As will be described in the chapter on distressing reading, without the positive motivation, engagement, and personal connections some decodable texts can be alienating. Effective stress-reducing and positively motivating strategies are needed to facilitate the processing of decoding patterns so the decoded word can pass unhindered through the effective filters to enter brain patterning and be expressed in fluent reading. If word recognition is not learned successfully, students will be stuck in unfulfilling, slow, and laborious reading. Modeling Fluency Begin any modeling activity, such as the one that precedes a rereading lesson by describing the goals of the activity to build student connection and focus. If your students are all at the same level of English literacy and won't be confused by modeling the correct and incorrect fluency, it helps to emphasize the things you are listening for by exaggerating fluent and non-fluent reading. The caution here is to be sure that the incorrect modeling is not similar to the errors frequently made by specific students. If that is the case, I stick to modeling the proper fluency. When modeling, I use humor and exaggeration to keep students interested, and we discuss cartoon characters that are known for very artificially deliberate speech errors or overly slurred, mumbled, barely understandable speech. Again, this is not done when a student in the class has a similar speech problem, when students ask about stutterers or other people with speech disorders who are not fluent speakers. We use the teachable moment to revisit the topic of responding to people with differences. Because our supportive classroom community is built from the first day with an emphasis on respect, for oneself, others, and our planet, the stage is set for these types of discussions. Page 58. Modeling Supportive Reading Supportive reading groups require that students are comfortable with the activity, without embarrassment or boredom and with enough intrinsic reinforcement to motivate them to persevere. The setting must be low stress. Small groups should have opportunities to work together supportively and to practice the appropriate responses to classmates' errors and successes. Preparatory modeling of these appropriate responses can begin in a non-reading activity response to open-ended, student-centered questions such as, What did you do this weekend? to give students the experience of speaking to the class and listening attentively with proper response behavior. When students have developed the ability to listen respectfully, without snickering or correcting their classmates, they are ready for small group pre-reading activities. When appropriate, it does help to model the difference between smooth, fluent, expressive reading and choppy, incorrectly punctuated reading. I demonstrate using my voice at higher and lower pitches, volumes, and speeds, and we discuss how it changes the meaning of the words. Students then take turns selecting the way they want the sentence to sound, angry, frightened, assertive, secretive. Volunteers read the sentence their way and call on classmates to guess what their intent was. I had originally done this by having the volunteer first whisper to a partner or to me what his or her intent was. But when there were errors in interpretation or even in the demonstration some students were frustrated. By not having the readers reveal intent first, the students have the option of accepting any reasonable interpretation made by a classmate. This does not reduce the effectiveness of the lesson because students are still practicing the finer aspects of expressive fluency following my modeling. Page 59. Choral Reading Choral reading gives students the experience of reading aloud without the stress of reading alone. 
based upon the previously described research demonstrating that repeated stimulation of neuronal networks increases their efficiency, it makes sense that the experience of reading aloud together reinforces patterns. When we start the choral reading, I ask students to whisper the words as I read aloud. This process continues until students become more confident. As the reading progresses and I drop my volume, students begin to read more loudly. At first it may be the louder readers who can give confidence to the others to follow as long as I intervene to keep a reasonable pace. Eventually, as the vocabulary of the new book becomes more familiar and content and prediction kick in to increase fluency, I drop my voice down in volume and distinctly mouth the words. Individualized and Paired Activities After students have built confidence, lowered stress, and open flow through their effective filters, they are ready for more individualized guidance through a variety of activities to build fluency. Student Adult Reading In student adult reading, students read one-on-one -on -one at their fluency level with a parent, classroom aid, or teacher. As in choral reading, first the adult models, then individual students whisper repeat along with the adult, and then alone. The adult can scaffold the student's reading by joining in for corrective feedback until, with the Lowered Effective Filter, the practice gradually builds student speed, accuracy, and expressiveness in oral reading. This adult modeling may be providing the mirror neuron stimulation for students to use to pattern their own reading. Page 60. Partner Reading. Partner reading pairs more fluent readers with less fluent readers as they take turns reading aloud to each other. This activity requires modeling and explicit instruction in proper behavior and in what comments or corrections are appropriate. Students are motivated to follow these rules because they want the privilege of working with partners. I have found that this activity is most successful at building student confidence and skill when prearranged modeling by a rehearsed pair of students precedes it. Students see how partners acknowledge each other even for trying. That was a great first try. That encouragement from a partner is the type of intrinsic reward that increases dopamine release and the positive benefits of this neurotransmitter, the pair that models the activity can be coached to make corrective comments in appropriate language that includes something positive with each correction, such as, your reading speed and volume were very good. Now you can change your voice to show that this sentence is a question. For this activity, use short, interesting texts at the level of the less fluent reader and prepare the pair with pre-reading teacher modeling. Use texts with content that relates to the student's lives and, ideally, texts that relate to shared class experiences. Other text choices are books with information that the class has heard or read about previously. First, the more fluent reader reads a sentence or paragraph. The amount of reading done before the second student repeats the reading needs to be predetermined and kept short enough to keep both readers engaged, then the less fluent reader reads the same text. While the second reader reads, the first reader needs to let the less fluent reader try to work out challenging words or phrases before giving hints to model the correct reading. Both readers use the supportive words of encouragement they have practiced and seen modeled by student reader pairs who demonstrated the activity before students work in their independent pairs. Page 61. If the more fluent reader gives corrective help, the rules are that the second reader rereads the sentence or passage until he or she reads it independently with expressiveness and accuracy. Strategy adapted from Meyer and Felton, 1999. Designations can be made in the text as to where the pair should stop, summarize, personalize, and connect. For example, I use the code SSPC and write it in appropriate places in the text. Students then take turns following the code. Stop, the student reading the passage says, I'll stop now for SSPC. Summarize, the student who read the passage summarizes the content. The other member of the pair can add information. Personalize, the student who read the passage relates the material to a personal experience or describes how he or she might someday be in a similar situation. The partner does the same. Connect, the student who read the passage connects the material to something previously read or seen in a film, preferably one that was a shared class experience for both students in the pair. The partner does the same or adds more detail. 
These prompts may stimulate relational memories that become available as memory templates for the text being read. Just as fluent reading builds comprehension, comprehension increases when text is connected with stored memories and prior knowledge. The increased comprehension then adds success to the subsequent oral reading, which becomes more accurate and fluent. Tape-assisted reading Tape-assisted reading allows students to read and reread books along with a recording they select from a shelf or a box designated by independent reading levels. Students who feel uncomfortable reading in front of another person benefit a great deal from this activity. For the first listening, the student listens to the tape and points to the words as he or she hears them read. In subsequent listenings, students read the words they can along with the tape. Page 62 an assessment takes place when the students decide they are ready to read the book aloud to you without the tape. Students can bring the books home to read to their families as a reward for successful mastery of the fluent, expressive reading of the book. When I make these tapes I follow the format of the pre-made ones and use a bell or other sound to alert the reader to turn the page. You can create tapes for a variety of fluency levels and to emphasize different aspects of fluency. In some tapes you can emphasize phrasing and have two types of read-along books available, one with slash marks between chunks and one without the marks. Computer-assisted recording such as that available with Macintosh GarageBand software allows you to add variable speed for rereading practice. My students have used the computer technology to make their own read-aloud original books, very inspiring for reluctant writers who enjoy computer technology for classmates to share or to give to younger siblings. I don't want to distract the students' concentration on fluency so I don't add music to my tapes, but I do allow the adding of sound effects and music to student-produced recorded book projects. Strategies to Build Fluency Through Intelligence Strengths Howard Gardner developed the theory that intelligence is made up of distinct learning proficiencies that can work individually or together. In 1983, Gardner reported seven such learning strengths or styles, which he called intelligences. In 1996 he added an eighth, naturalist intelligence, Gardner, 1999. Using multiple intelligences as a guide allows you to vary fluency activities to engage students' dominant intelligences. I have interpreted these intelligences by considering which fluency promoting activities might best fit with the proposed brain response networks associated with their learning strengths. This is another area where I am making the connections based on my understanding and interpretation of the brain learning research. However, controlled research studies with neuroimaging and cognitive testing have not been done on these strategies. Page 63 Linguistic intelligence is characterized by sensitivity to the meaning and order of words. Students with linguistic intelligence are adept at using language to understand and convey information. They are often sensitive to the nuances, order, and rhythm of words. Students I have worked with who have strengths in linguistic intelligence enjoy reading activities that include rhymes, verbal word games, telling stories, reading silently, and reading aloud. With strengths in vocabulary building, memorizing, and learning foreign languages, these students appear to have greater development in auditory processing that facilitates their auditory learning skills. These students are more likely to recall what they hear, follow spoken instructions, and build fluency by listening and speaking. They are often the leading voices that build group confidence and skills in choral reading and repeated reading. These verbal learners can also be excellent partners in paired oral reading. Musical rhythmic intelligence can include sensitivity to pitch and rhythm of sounds and responsiveness to listening to or performing music. These students might be able to hear a song or tune and remember, play, or sing its melody without printed music. With students with musical rhythmic intelligence, I use fluency strategies where learning is connected to rhythmic constructs. These students have been particularly responsive to the placement of strategic slash marks as cues that chunk words correctly for fluent reading. These students are also engaged by choral reading. Logical mathematical intelligence is reflected in understanding abstractions, cause and effect, and code and pattern recognition. These analytic learners respond to fluency activities presented in sequential steps, 
with rules and examples, teacher-directed lessons, clear goals and requirements. Children with strong logical mathematical intelligence often prefer to make decisions based on logic and respond to knowing the reasons behind our rules of punctuation. Page 64. Because they tend to focus on details and facts, they seem to enjoy the opportunity to preview text independently before the class activity, often after teacher modeling. This may help them analyze the punctuation and use the rules they have learned to determine where natural pauses or voice inflections are appropriate. These learners also enjoy creating and even designing their own goal assessment charts and graphs to follow their progress. If properly coached in cooperative community behavior, these students can help classmates create and add data to their own assessment graphing charts. Visual spatial intelligence is related to aptitude in understanding the relationships of objects, concepts, or images in different fields or dimensions. Visual learners may have more developed occipital lobe visual processing and relational memory connections to objects and words they see. They are especially responsive to lessons where I incorporate visual observations of the punctuation and text as they watch a fluent reader model the facial and lingual movements of the associated oral reading. These students seem to benefit a great deal from independent practice, such as with note cards and RAN activities, to build their fluency speed. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence includes the ability to use fine and gross motor skills in visual or performing arts, physical play, sports, and object manipulative activities. My more tactile students respond well to word or letter cards as prompts for oral fluency practice just as they enjoy using sandpaper letters when learning to recognize letters and make sound associations. Because they appear to recall what they touch, their fluency seems to respond to actually feeling the movement in their lips and faces when they read with expression. The more kinesthetic students in this category are excited about activities where they trace or draw letters in sand, water, or in the air. To build fluency, they enjoy adding movements to their verbal expressiveness such as in readers' theater activities where they use their body awareness to move their bodies to connect with text and convey expressiveness. Page 65. When doing oral reading with tapes, they add verbal fluency by occasionally working with hand puppets or watching their faces in mirrors to react kinesthetically to text. Interpersonal intelligence is evident in children who work well with others and in group learning activities. They tend to be perceptive and responsive to others' moods and feelings. Their ability to interact with others with understanding and to interpret classmates' behaviors makes these students well-suited for peer-slash-paired reading leadership roles, such as peer models before the class tries new fluency activities, and they are helpful verbal prompters in choral reading. They seem to particularly enjoy choosing books about interpersonal relationships. Intrapersonal intelligence can be apparent in students with dedication to an understanding of their own beliefs and goals. They are more independent and less likely to be influenced by what others think of them. These students seem to form their most successful relational memories when they are able to link the text to their personal experiences or to positive emotional connections. They enjoy working independently at goals they help establish and they enjoy tape-supported or one-on-one -on -one work with adults, rather than with peers, for fluency practice. They sometimes need to be permitted to whisper even after the first repeated oral reading in group situations. These students also tend to respond well to the graphing of their self-timed fluency assessments and making metacognition notes in writing instead of verbalizing them. Technology for Fluency Computerized reading fluency programs have been used to assess individual student fluency and adjust instruction to suit the needs of each reader. Neuroimaging is becoming more helpful in determining which students are most likely to benefit from computerized interventions. I have found computer technology helpful using visual and auditory input that highlights patterns for fluency practice. Page 66 Students build speed and accuracy through practice with the patterns of oral expression for phrase chunking, punctuation response, and content influence on verbal expressiveness. Even basic word processing programs can be used to highlight what is being emphasized through changes in color, size, font, animation, or grouping. 
when considering the currently available and future computer programs to improve student fluency, look for programs with flexible responsiveness. A variety of activities for motivating fluency building practice for students with different learning style preferences, and programs that incorporate simultaneous assessment, guidance, and opportunities for students to choose materials. Specific guidance for fluency building software may be available from school districts reading curriculum, or technology specialists. A collaborative study from neurocognitive researchers at Cornell University and University of Pennsylvania studied reading levels of children ages 6 to 9 with behavioral and fMRI scans before and after two types of interventions. The children were assigned to their groups randomly, not based on their reading differences. One group participated in the Reading Works TRW a computerized program of word building focusing on letter sound relationships within visual word forms. The other program, Guided Reading GR, uses authentic texts to guide reading programs based on feedback from periodic comprehension assessments built into the programs. Each group of students receive 20-40 minute sessions of one-on-one -on -one tutoring with their program. The researchers interpreted their data to suggest that the type of intervention influenced different reading skills and appeared to be associated with increased brain activity in the predicted regions of the brain most associated on scans with the coding activities. The type of educational environment was found to modulate the degree to which the initial activity predicted reading behavioral outcomes. Page 67 the amount of measured improvement in students receiving TRW correlated with increased activity in the upper temporal lobe brain areas that had been found to be most active during phonological processing and the coding. Similarly, the amount of cognitively measured improvement in students receiving the GR intervention correlated with increased activity in the frontal lobe brain and lower left temporal areas that have been associated with whole word recognition. Oxetal, 2005. One implication of these preliminary studies is that if and when cognitive science working with neuroimaging studies confirms the differentiation of brain regions as clearly linked to subtypes of fluency, such as in phonological processing, decoding, or recognizing whole words, that information might help match the type of intervention with an individual student's needs. If the results are confirmed in follow-up cognitive and fMRI pre- and post-intervention studies and the correlations continue to be consistent, the hope is that the fMRI images would not be necessary if the reading skill cognitive tests can adequately predict both fMRI findings and the type of intervention that is best suited for the child. There are a great deal of ifs here, but as more data comes in providing strong correlations between cognitive testing, fMRI studies, and student response to specific fluency interventions, computer-assisted instruction could play a big part in implementing individually constructed intervention, assessment, and feedback programs. In the meantime, let us be wary of the business that reading intervention has become. For example, most of the available training programs require a great commitment of time and money, with a standard training protocol, 100 minutes a day, 5 days a week representing more than one-third of students' school instruction time, Nature Neuroscience, 2004.